It's 20 years since the Governor-General sacked Gough Whitlam. For many of those caught up in our greatest constitutional crisis, the time has finally come to tell it how it was. If I had removed the Governor-General surreptitiously, I'd be as popular and respected as Kerr became for removing me surreptitiously. Good evening and welcome to Four Corners. In tonight's program, Gough Whitlam, Malcolm Fraser and other key players revisit the 1975 dismissal in a spirit of remarkable candour. We hear for the first time just how much Malcolm Fraser knew in advance and just how little Whitlam saw it coming. There's nothing quite as fascinating as the big moments in history as revealed from the mouths of the players themselves. Not just the facts, but the underlying strategies, the motivations, the doubts and deceptions. Our guest reporter is editor-in-chief of the Australian newspaper, Paul Kelly, and author of a new book, November 1975. The Governor General may dissolve the Senate and the House of Representatives simultaneously. Here was a battle uh, between uh, Fraser and Whitlam. It was a battle of, uh, uh, of two uh, men of uh, huge ego and uh, of two great uh, power seekers. They were uh, jousting, or they were plunging at each other in the arena, uh, mounted on their, on their war horses, you know, the Liberal Party and the Labour Party. Well, of course it was a grab for power. It was just political thuggery. Now, therefore, I, Sir John Robert Kerr, the Governor-General of Australia, do, by this my proclamation, dissolve the Senate and the House of Representatives, given under my hand on the Great Seal of Australia on the 11th of November, 1975, by His Excellency's command, Malcolm Fraser, Prime Minister, John R. Kerr, Governor-General. God save the Queen. Proclamation which you have just heard read by the Governor General's official secretary was countersigned Malcolm Fraser. How do you think the Liberal Party looks on November 1975 today? They ought to look upon it as a, a matter of pride. Nobody trusted Kerr. He acted dishonourably and deceptively. These extraordinary events of 1975 started and finished here in the Senate. It was a battle between the Labor government led by Gough Whitlam that dominated the House of Representatives and the opposition led by Malcolm Fraser that controlled the Senate. Fraser blocked the budget demanding an election, but Whitlam determined to stay in office, defied the Senate. The climax came when the Governor-General, Sir John Kerr, dismissed Whitlam, forcing an election. As a journalist, I covered the crisis, talking to both Whitlam and Fraser. What I learnt was that 1975 was more than a constitutional crisis. It was a personal and psychological battle between three proud and ruthless men. Whitlam came to power in 1972, a self-styled man of destiny, 
determined to change Australia's direction after 23 years of coalition rule. But Whitlam was a flawed hero. He had his head in the clouds. He had great dreams of making Australia a more civilised place, some of which he succeeded in doing. But I don't think he was ever the, uh, the rough, tough politician that is called for in the hurly-burly of Australian politics. Gough was a man in such a hurry. Uh, we all recall he couldn't even wait to have a proper ministry. He and Lance Barnard had to be uh, the duo that ran everything. They kept falling over themselves. And, uh, and it was a heaven-set opportunity for an opposition. If you become leader, will you be looking for an early election? Well, one of the things, if I was leader, that I would uh, certainly not want to do is to give the Prime Minister, Mr Whitlam, any indication when an election might occur. I'd want to uh, uh, keep that knowledge buttoned up and catch him one day with his pants well and truly down. In March 1975, Malcolm Fraser became Liberal Party leader after a party room coup. Fraser, as tall as Whitlam, was thick-set, cunning and lethal. Convinced of the superiority of the Liberals as Australia's ruling party, Fraser was searching for an early election. All those for an election, all those who want Mr Whitlam to get the hell out of Canberra. It was a Balmain-born son of a boilermaker, John Kerr, a brilliant student, a Labor Party member, barrister and Chief Justice of New South Wales. He was Whitlam's choice as Governor-General. The Labor Party saw this office as purely ceremonial, but it would fall to Kerr to arbitrate the looming crisis. Yes, I think there are uh, many things that we have to do. The first... Whitlam thought he knew Kerr, but right from the start, he misjudged his man. John had aspired at one stage to move into politics and as a matter of fact most people thought he would go into politics. In fact there were some who thought he'd become Prime Minister. He took the job when it was offered essentially because he always wanted to be uh, at the centre of where things were really moving, the centre of power in Canberra. Well he was a gregarious man, highly intelligent uh, and generally a likeable man. I was very fond of him. I think he was a man who regarded his own importance very highly. Um, I've used the words, um, I think he suffered or had folly de grandeur. And I think once he became Governor General, he thought, well, especially in the state of crisis, he was his chance to show Whitlam who was number one, who was running the country. When Whitlam appointed Kerr Governor General, there was one issue they never discussed the powers of the office. Whitlam believed the Governor-General could act only on ministerial advice, but Kerr had a different view. Goff believed that in all things the Governor-General and John Kerr as uh, Goff's man would have to do what Goff Whitlam advised or told him to do. Um, Goff did not believe that the Governor-General or the Office of Governor-General had uh, at the last resort an independent capacity. Convention says that a Governor-General acts on ministerial advice. But there's a quaint exception to this rule. It's when a Queen or Governor-General calls upon the reserve powers to resolve a crisis. These powers, often called the royal prerogative, can be exercised without ministerial advice or even against the advice of ministers. Sir John Kerr had a fascination with these powers and he was certainly prepared to use them. Now, don't sell the United Nations short. Stick up... The former leader of the Labor Party, Dr. Evatt, had been a patron of the young John Kerr. Both men were influenced by the dismissal in 1932 of the Labor Premier of New South Wales, Jack Lang, by the Governor, Sir Philip Game. Evatt was prompted to write a famous book, The King and His Dominion Governors, which accepted that a Governor-General had the power to dismiss a government. John... I was talking to Abbott a great deal about the reserve powers, about how much of the reserve powers had survived uh, in Australia, 
what they were, how they would be, could be exercised, so that uh, he became very closely interested in the reserve powers from very early in, uh, in his career. The seeds of the 1975 crisis lay in events which occurred at the Lodge a year before. Black Friday, the 13th of December, 1974. An executive council meeting was held to approve a loan authority of $4 billion for Minerals Minister Rex Connor. The Governor-General, who must sign all executive decisions, was not contacted before this crucial meeting, and his approval did not occur until the next day. The loans affair was born. Uh, I phoned him. It was a Friday night, I think, wasn't it? A Friday night. And I was leaving for overseas uh, the Saturday afternoon following. And uh, so I rang him uh, at uh, Kirribilli House. And they said, oh, he's gone to the ballet. He was at the ballet. Romeo and Juliet with a new bride. And uh, so I said to the staff there, I said, well, when do you expect him back? And they said, oh, well, usually doesn't like being disturbed at when he comes back from functions at night. I said, well, you always take a cup of tea into him first thing in the morning, I believe, about six o'clock. I said, would you tell him, well, tell me when you've taken the cup of tea in, because I'll then ring him. And I did. John was at the opera house on that particular night and wasn't even told that uh, the executive council was to meet. Um, uh, first of all, he thought it might have been an accident, some bit of a bungle on the part of uh, some of the uh, bureaucratic people who had to organise it, but it uh, soon became apparent to John that he had been deliberately not told about the meeting and therefore wasn't there. Uh, and that, uh, I, don't, I think it would be too strong a word to say that that caused him to become suspicious of Goff, but it caused him to have a sort of uneasiness about Goff. It's, it's true the Governor-General was concerned about that first... But it uh, soon became apparent to John that he had been deliberately not told about the meeting and therefore wasn't there. Uh, and that, uh, I, don't, I think it would be too strong a word to say that that caused him to become suspicious of Goff, but it caused him to have a sort of uneasiness about Goff. It's, it's true the Governor-General was concerned about that first Executive Council meeting, but that was only in retrospect. But Kerr, of course, by that stage was being asked by some of his uh, mates, because he'd moved up Government House, of course, he, he often saw some... Uh, he was being courted by a lot of distinguished people, and he, he enjoyed it. And he was very embarrassed. They said, well, you've been authorising any... Uh, billion dollar loans recently <laughs> and he was getting quite embarrassed by it but he never raised it with me afterwards at all never how long have you been involved in this particular aspect of your business raising uh, money raising money only about one year only about one year that's it what was your state labor relied upon this obscure money dealer tirath kimlani but kimlani never raised the money and the government's reputation was compromised. The politics of 1975 was dominated by the loans affair, ministerial sackings and economic upheaval, which only tempted Malcolm Fraser to force an election. The clinching event was the forced resignation of Minerals Minister Rex Connor, when it was revealed that he and Kim Lani had negotiated about the loan after the cancellation of the authority. When Connor resigned, Fraser pulled the trigger. It was because the whole record of the government over a considerable period um, was disgraceful. Uh, there had been scandal after scandal. There had been deception of the Executive Council, deception of the Governor-General himself. And, uh, you know, it's easy to forget these things now. Fraser was now prepared to use the powers of the Senate to block the budget until Whitlam agreed to call a general election. An election Labor was certain to lose. This was the first fateful step that precipitated the 1975 crisis. 
Fraser was lucky, thanks to the Queensland Premier. Joe Bjorki-Peterson had defied convention and appointed an anti-Labour unknown, Albert Patrick Field, in place of a Queensland Labour senator who had suddenly died. Could I ask you a reaction to, towards a number of other leading Labour people, towards Mr Whitlam, for example? What do you think of him? Well, I had a bit of time from the first, but uh, when he uh, subject the Premier of Queensland to such abuse... What abuse is that? ...as a Bible-bashing bastard, well, that, I could never vote for Mr Whitlam. I was adamantly opposed to a final act which would block the budget. We'd had uh, two instances in my life in Victoria where an upper house had blocked the budget and I think most people, certainly I and others, thought that it was improper. The opposition party room endorsed Fraser's decision on the 15th of October. They decided for tactical reasons to defer, not reject the budget, and Field's appointment gave Fraser the numbers to do it. Well, if you defeated the bills, the state is asking the leader of the opposition to, to become prime minister because he couldn't get a bill through the uh, House of Representatives. I mean, you get to a total and absolute stalemate. Uh, so therefore, we had to put them on ice. The opposition now has no choice. We will use the power vested in us by the Constitution and delay the passage of the government's money bills through the Senate until the Parliament goes to the people. Recall these words. At this point, Whitlam took his epic decision to defy the opposition and the Senate. It would be the greatest battle of his career. Fraser's audacity was met by Whitlam's defiance. The crisis was now joined. We will not yield to blackmail. We will not be panicked. We will not turn over the government of this country to vested interests, pressure groups and newspaper proprietors whose tactics would destroy the standards and traditions of parliamentary government. The business of government will go on. Whitlam was so determined that the, uh, the, the House of Representatives should prevail over the Senate because he saw this as the critical issue uh, of our time and of this century. Whitlam's entire strategy depended upon the acquiescence of Sir John Kerr. He was adamant that Kerr would and should support him. But Whitlam had misread Kerr. From the very start of the crisis, the Governor-General had lost his trust in Whitlam and he saw a dismissal as a possibility. So must Sir John Kerr accept your advice, whatever advice you give? Unquestionably. The Governor-General takes the advice from his Prime Minister and from no one else. And must act on that advice? Unquestionably. The Governor-General must act on the advice of his Prime Minister. There is no tolerance here. He must None do... None whatever. Gough proceeded to needle John, I think that's, that's a justified word, uh, publicly announcing constantly that the Governor-General would do exactly what I say. There's no exception. He just has to do exactly what I say. And, of course, uh, that wasn't the position at all. The Governor-General had his own independent rights. And um, uh, as, as Gough constantly reiterated this theme, so John became more and more troubled. Woodlam treated him more or less like an office boy. And uh, uh, if I'd been Kerr, I'd have built up a fair head of resentment. It's true, as Barry Jones says, that Whitlam treats everybody as equals, even the Queen. So I suppose Kerr felt that by being treated as an equal by Whitlam was in some way derogatory to the office. The day after the budget was deferred, the senior constitutional lawyer within the opposition, Bob Ellicott, released a crucial opinion, a copy of which was requested by Sir John Kerr. Well, so far as the Governor-General was concerned, I indicated that uh, I thought he had the, the power 
uh, to dismiss a government, which meant dismissing the Prime Minister, withdrawing the commission to the Prime Minister, if the government persisted in the attitude that it could govern without supply. I uh, don't think that Bob Ellicott was right in uh, asserting that whenever there was a possibility of supply being refused, the government had an obligation to resign, the Prime Minister and the Ministry. Uh, that means that however dastardly the process, the refusal may be, however self-serving, the a government of the day can be put to the sword, and I don't think that was right. On the night of the 16th of October, there was a state banquet at Yarralumla. It was at this function that Sir John Kerr became alarmed that Whitlam might try to sack him. Lady Kerr was there, uh, Gough Whitlam and uh, Margaret Whitlam, uh, Tunapdol Razak and his wife. And in a jesting sort of way, Gough said, uh, I don't know how it cropped up, but Gough said, well, it could be a race between um, me getting to the Queen to have you dismissed and you terminating my commission as, uh, as Prime Minister. And everybody laughed. It was a sort of joke. But it was one of those jokes about, uh, behind which there was a great deal of meaning. Well, I just quite lightheartedly, you know, passed it off. And, of course, Kerr saw very much more significance in what I said than there was. It demonstrated that Gough understood that he had the power to go to the Queen and demand that uh, John be sacked. Uh, it demonstrated to John that uh, uh, Whitlam knew all about the reserve powers and that the, uh, the danger that, uh, to him, the danger to him, that John might exercise them. So it was a very significant little joking interlude. A few days later, the Governor-General held a private dinner at his Sydney residence, Admiralty House, with the Governor of New South Wales, Sir Roden Cutler. Sir John Kerr's comments at this meeting revealed his determination to keep his counsel from the Prime Minister. I did say that I thought he should talk to Whitlam, um, and uh, that, after all, is the requirement. At any rate, um, Kerr had not discussed it with Whitlam. He made it fairly clear he didn't want to. And I said, uh, well, John, I said, uh, of course, the Prime Minister could move beforehand and, and uh, have your commission withdrawn. And at that stage, he became quite animated and said, yes, I know, I know. For the future of the country... Of After nearly a week into the deadlock, there was agitation in the country. Kerr was now prompted by the force of public opinion to look for a solution. With Whitlam's permission, he then began talking to Fraser as well. The first Fraser-Kerr meeting was on the 21st of October. I thought that uh, if he asked if he could uh, talk to Fraser, then I should agree to that. You assumed that the Governor-General would act honourably uh, during yes, such I did. dialogue? We would have had a cup of tea or a drink, I think, um, through um, most of those meetings. That was his general practice. Uh, and he, he was, a, a, in some ways, a chatty sort of person. I mean, he liked to talk. He liked people. The man who served as departmental head to both Whitlam and Fraser. And he, he was a... a in some ways a chatty sort of person. I mean, he liked to talk, he liked people. The man who served as departmental head to both Whitlam and Fraser now reveals startling information which suggests this first meeting was a turning point. The Governor-General had indicated to Mr Fraser that he had the threat of dismissal hanging over him and that if he showed his hand to Mr Whitlam that he would be dismissed and I think that and whilst the Governor General may have not spelled out to Mr Fraser precisely what action he had in mind uh, I think that was sufficient indication that anyone would need 
uh, that the Governor General's decision or action will be unacceptable uh, to Mr Whitlam. That would have been a very significant remark to make to Mr Fraser. That's right, yes. And it was made. So these comments that you've made to us about uh, Sir John Kerr's concerns, the concerns that the Sir John Kerr conveyed to Mr Fraser, Mr Fraser told you about this discussion? Yes. So you did feel during the crisis that the Governor-General was in fact under threat from the Prime Minister? Yes, I did. Did you gain this impression from uh, your talks with Sir John, from the way he acted, from signals he gave? Mm, no, not at all. Just from a judgment of the circumstances and uh, a judgment of the people on the stage. The uh, then head of the Prime Minister's Department, John Minnerdew, uh, says that after the dismissal, in a discussion with you, you indicated that uh, during your talks with Sir John Kerr during the crisis, mm. the Governor-General did in fact indicate to you that he was concerned that the Prime Minister might move against him. No. Didn't happen. Are you quite certain about this? Because, as I understand it, uh, uh, John Menadieu did record a note for file after this discussion with you, which was held on the 28th of January 1976. Well, um, he's got an advantage over me then, because I never recorded notes for file. Um, my memory of these events is generally pretty good, um, but maybe John Menadieu misunderstood the conversation he'd had with me. After this meeting, Fraser changed his public stance towards Kerr. He became deferential. Of course we'd accept the Governor-General's decision. It'd be utterly wrong to do anything else. But Whitlam remained convinced that Kerr was with him. He refused to consider dismissal as a serious option throughout the crisis. What consideration was given to the possibility that Kerr might dismiss Whitlam? Almost none. In fact, I would say it was never a factor in our assessment of either the strategy or the likely outcome of the situation. They never understood it, which was very, very sad. Uh, and uh, there was a failure, in my view, to impress upon the bureaucracy and the other advisers, you know, very uh, gifted people like Graham Freudenberg and so on, what the legal character of the circumstances was. Because if you didn't understand that, you didn't understand the political character. And if you didn't understand the political character, you would lose. In the hundreds of divisions which have taken place, in the House of Representatives last year and this year, the Labor government has never been defeated. Whitlam's confidence was driven by the tide of public opinion, which was hostile to Fraser's blocking of the budget. Whitlam gambled everything on the opposition losing its nerve. He needed only one senator to cross the floor. How confident were you during the crisis that the opposition would, in fact, prevail? Well... I mean, it, depending on which time of day you ask me that question. <laughs> um, I mean, you, you had 30 people up here, uh, of which you could say uh, two-thirds were rock solid, you forget about them. But there were about ten others, I suppose, about a third of them, who came and went. You know, uh, well, they didn't go totally, but uh, they had worries. Oh. They had all sorts of worries. Mainly, of course, that uh, um, what we were doing, uh, we wouldn't get away with in the public mind. As the crisis entered its third week, the focus shifted to Melbourne and the festivities surrounding the Melbourne Cup. Federal and state, Liberal and Country Party leaders held a summit meeting at Treasury Place. They took two decisions. To stand firm, and to offer a tactical concession. The next day, Fraser saw the Governor-General 
and offered to pass the budget immediately if Whitlam agreed to a general election before the middle of 1976. We put it forward in good faith and if he'd accepted it, uh, there would have been no dismissal. I think it's an indication of how obsessed, I think it's probably the word, Whitlam had become because the proposition was a very reasonable one. 30 minutes after Fraser left, Kerr saw Whitlam at Government House, Melbourne. The Prime Minister rejected the Fraser compromise out of hand. Whitlam was chasing a total victory. But Kerr claims that Whitlam then resorted to provocative intimidation. Gough said to John, the only way that I will call an election is if you do a Philip game on me. By which he meant, well, you'll have to use your reserve powers to sack me. And what he really meant, meant was, and of course you haven't got the guts to do it. That was the significance of what he was saying. But of course John did have the guts to do it. Now, Kerr says, in defence of himself in his book, that during the talks he had with you in the crisis, you indicated to Kerr that the only way he could obtain an election would be to do a game. Did you say that? No, I did not. I know he's written that. But, Goff, that is your phrase, isn't it? Do again. I mean, no, I... I think he used it to Hayden, didn't he? He used that to phrase to Hayden. But I think I've heard you use this phrase yourself. Well, I never used it to him. I, uh, when, I, I must have used it subsequently. I think. Still supremely confident of Kerr, Whitlam now looked for ways to intensify the pressure on Fraser. One solution that Gough Whitlam flirted with was the Senate election. Now, Fraser knew that. That's why he wanted the Liberal and Country Party Premiers to advise their governors not to issue the writs for such an election. Two questions flowed from this. Would the Premiers agree to sabotage a Senate election? And would the state governors acquiesce? My view would have been that it was wrong. I would have told Tom Lewis that I thought it was wrong and given him my reasons for saying that and if he insisted uh, that I should comply with his advice well as I say I would have sent it to the Queen saying I couldn't give assent and or agreement and give my views plus letter of resignation. I would have had severe doubts about uh, agreeing to it but as I said it never came to the point. On Cup Eve, there was a dinner at Government House, Melbourne, hosted by the Victorian Governor, Sir Henry Winnicky. Sir Henry Winnicky talked a great deal, and um, finally uh, Sir John Kerr, who was not showing that much interest in the conversation, got up and said to me, well, at least I think it's time we went to bed. And as we went up the stairs, he said, uh, Henry Winnicky doesn't understand the problem. Henry Winnicky, who was always a positive man anyway and with strong opinions, he made it clear to me that he uh, thought that Sir John Kerr had not acted correctly, that he should have consulted Whitlam, even presumably at the cost of Mr Whitlam trying to get him dismissed. I think a Governor-General or a Governor should never be worried about the security of their job. I think that's always on the line. And I think Sir John Kerr was not really prepared to put that on the line. I think he intentionally meant to deceive Whitlam and not give him any indication of what he might do. At the 100, and White going for home on Think Big. Holiday Wagons, the threat from Medici, but Think Big's going to win his second Melbourne Cup. I'm presenting it, of course, uh, under circumstances where the horse is the same, the jockey is the same, and, thank goodness, the Governor-General is the same. After the Cup, Kerr returned to Canberra, the pressure closing upon him. Neither Whitlam nor Fraser would back off. On the 6th of November, Kerr conducted his last consultations with the leaders. Fraser now turned up the pressure to get an election. I made it quite clear that in those circumstances, I would have to say that the Governor-General had let down not only the office of Governor-General, 
but the people of Australia because in many ways he holds that office and is custodian of the reserve powers. He was under pressure from uh, Fraser who was threatening uh, virtually, and this is what John said, virtually to denounce him as a Labour Party stooge. But at this meeting, in effect, you were really advising him mm. that he should dismiss Mr Whitlam. Uh, well, I wouldn't have put it in those terms. I would have said if there is not an election, um, we'll, you know, have to say something about it. Fraser, can you tell us anything about your meeting with the Governor-General? No, no, I couldn't on other occasions and I can't on this occasion. Is your stand still firm about blocking supply? Of course it is. Can he give you any advice? Malcolm Fraser returned from Yarralumla, convinced he would prevail. I saw both leaders later that day. Fraser told me that the crisis would be resolved by Kerr's dismissal of the Prime Minister. But Whitlam assured me that Kerr was rock solid. The Governor-General now began serious preparations for the dismissal and he was intent on keeping his plan a secret from Whitlam. I can remember several little incidents that, uh, in which he deliberately, I believe, set out to convince me that that was not even on his mind. <clears throat> and I think that was dishonourable. Uh, he used me, an old friend, in order to lull Whitlam into a false sense of security. That's why I've been a uh, critic, why well, I never forgave him. The whole essence of the enterprise was surprise. It was ambush. And it was ambush, a weird notion, it was ambush in the centres of power. Why didn't Kerr properly consult and warn you? I don't know. I mean, he, let's face it, he was a weak man and a deceptive man, and a dishonourable man. It's quite true, John did not tell him what he was going to do. The reason for that we've already touched on. Because John was convinced, I think rightly, that as soon as uh, Goff was sure that the reserve powers were going to be exercised uh, to uh, uh, dismiss him as, as uh, Prime Minister, then he would have gone straight to the Queen. John's view, as I've said, was that that would have been a disaster. But moreover, he felt no obligation uh, to tell Goff, one of the two contending parties, what uh, his stream of thought was. And indeed, there was no obligation. So he didn't mislead him at all. Goff misled himself. But some people predicted the dismissal. So he didn't mislead him at all. Goff misled himself. But some people predicted the dismissal, including the newspaper proprietor, Rupert Murdoch. I had lunch with him and with Ken Cowley and told me, Rupert Murdoch did, that um, in, in effect there'd be, uh, the government would, would be dismissed, uh, there would be an election for the House of Representatives, and in a friendly sort of way said, well, John, don't worry, you'll be appointed as ambassador to, uh, to Tokyo, which, which turned out to be, he, he was right on both counts. It is a conversation which Murdoch denies. Sir John Kerr Isn't was so worried during the crisis that, that his office that contacted case. Buckingham Palace to find out the exact procedures for a Governor-General's removal by the Prime Minister. Whether Whitlam would have been prepared to have sacked Kerr is the conundrum of the crisis. Do you think that Mr Whitlam would have been prepared to move against Sir John Kerr? Yes. I have no doubt whatsoever. The political consequences of Whitlam sacking the Governor-General would have been so horrendous that I don't believe uh, that it would have been contemplated. And it certainly was, had not been contemplated up to that stage. You wouldn't have moved against the Governor-General? No. I think I would have had enough sense to realise that if I had removed the Governor-General surreptitiously, I'd be as popular and respected, as Kerr became for removing me surreptitiously. Having decided to sack Whitlam, Kerr wanted the support of the Chief Justice of the High Court, Sir Garfield Barwick. Barwick was expecting to be asked. As early as the 20th of September, Kerr had told Barwick that he might need his opinion. 
I heard no more of him until the uh, 9th of, of November on a Sunday evening when he, he rang and asked me would I see him the next morning on my way to court. I did and then he asked me the question in substance not in terms was he bound to keep a prime minister who couldn't obtain supply and that's a question that's not difficult really to answer and that's the only question in one sense which i answered that question i thought no court could decide barwick was an icon to him uh, he still is to any of the survivors of that generation. And it could have got back to Kerr, it probably did, that Barwick, who despised everybody, had said of him, oh, Jack Kerr, his generation referred to him as Jack before he became John, Jack Kerr ought to sack Whitler, but he'll never have the guts. Now, Kerr was a bit short of guts too. <clears throat> he would have consulted Barwick for reinforcement, for approval. He was greatly strengthened by knowing that this eminent constitutional authority, Sir Garfield Barwick, uh, said, yes, you have not merely the power, but you have the duty to exercise the reserve powers. <laughs> Very good morning to you. Bill Darcy with AM for Tuesday the 11th of November and what a day of anniversaries today is. It's Remembrance Day, it's also the 10th anniversary of UDI, it's the day a new African nation comes into being and the day on which there could be some end to our own constitutional deadlock. November the 11th would be a busy day for Sir John Kerr. He had to remember the fallen and conduct an execution. Whitlam now proceeded with his plan to call a Senate election. He rang the Governor-General at mid-morning to make a lunchtime appointment to tender this advice. Unbeknown to Whitlam, Kerr had the dismissal documents ready. The Governor-General now rang Fraser. The contents of this discussion have been disputed between Fraser and Kerr. According to Fraser's version, it is clear he was alerted to Whitlam's dismissal as a possibility. The Governor-General rang and asked four questions, which he emphasised were hypothetical questions, but it had got to the stage where he, he, he felt that he needed to know what my response would be. And uh, the questions were, um, if I did become Prime Minister, uh, if I was commissioned to form a government, would I recommend an election? Um, would I get supply through? Uh, would I refrain from any witch hunts against um, the previous government? And would I regard the government as a caretaker government, making no important decisions until uh, after an election had been, a full election had been held? And I had no problem in saying yes to those four questions. His memory is at fault there. Um, he uh, probably would have guessed in a very, pretty convinced way that that was bound to happen because he knew the dilemma, he knew the reserve powers and he knew they were the only way out. So you can say that he probably strongly uh, suspected that that was going to happen but he had no, no preliminary warning at all. The last time that John saw a Fraser was on the 6th of November. <laughs> As Whitlam drove to Yarralumla to secure his Senate election, the Labour Party was euphoric. It believed that victory was near. Whitlam never saw the ambush. But in a mix-up, Fraser arrived at Government House before the Prime Minister. What would you have done if, in fact, you had known that Fraser was already at Government House? I would have driven back to Parliament House. You wouldn't have proceeded to go into the building? No, of course not. You would have smelt a rat? Clearly. Or two. I went to the Kerr study and sat down, as he indicated, 
And uh, then I said to him, oh, I, I have the advice in writing, which I told you I would be giving to you. And he said, well, before you come to that, I've got a, a letter for you. And uh, I'm terminating your commission. Now, I want to put to you uh, the Governor-General's version of this discussion because he says that you then indicated uh, that you wanted to contact the palace. No truth in that at all. I mean, how was I to contact the palace? Of course I wasn't. It's, you... an, it's an utter fabrication by him. Well, then I was uh, summoned into the Governor-General's office. Um, he told me that he had dismissed Mr. Whitlam because he'd not been able to get the budget through and had not recommended an election. And um, then I was commissioned as Prime Minister. And the Governor-General said, um, well, I expect, Prime Minister, you have some work to do uh, back at Parliament House. Whitlam had two responses to his dismissal, shock and acceptance. He retreated not to Parliament House to rally his forces, but to his home at the lodge. Well, I mean, imagine if... Uh, just put Keating in, in Whitlam's place. If Keating was on the receiving end of that sort of treatment, that wouldn't have been the end of it. He'd have torn the place down. We'd almost have had a revolution. They'd have had to call out the troops. But Goff, there was nothing of that. Goff was a constitutionalist and a traditionalist, and it didn't didn't occur to him to do anything but accept Kerr's verdict. Whitlam later joked that at the lodge he ate his meal after the execution. We uh, drove over to the lodge. I saw uh, Goff uh, sitting in the, the little extension of the dining room, a sort of a gazebo affair, sitting alone. I gave a, a V for victory sign. Uh, because that was our feeling, how well things were going. Mr Whitlam was sitting down, having, a, having lunch, and his exclamation was to me, the bastard's done a game on me. We sat there like stunned mullets. Meanwhile, Fraser had returned to Parliament House with one objective, to secure supply so that he could advise an election. Whitlam had not even told his Senate leadership of the dismissal. And I went off to uh, over to see Malcolm before the house met. And uh, as I was walking across King's Hall, Doug McClellan came up. Uh, Doug was then manager of government business in the Senate. Look, he said, I don't want to ambush you straight after lunch, but uh, as soon as the Senate meets at two o'clock, I think was the time, Ken Reed's going to move the gag uh, and really put the hammer on you fellows to pass or reject these bills. I said, all oh, right, eh? thanks. Uh, and that was the conversation. He went off. I went into um, Malcolm's room, and of course everybody's still full of excitement. And I said to Reg Withers, uh, Reg, how long will it take to get supply through? Well, I said, well, oh, pretty quick. He said, how? Somebody said, how? And I said, that's my secret. Because <laughs> I wasn't going to tell anyone what Doug had told me. I went in there, I said to uh, Reg Withers, who was the leader of the opposition in the Senate, uh, with whom I got on very well, uh, I said, look, Reg, we've got to get these bills through, stop this mucking around, or worse that effect. I said, we've got to agree to it. And Ken looked at me and he said, you know, he said, you're a funny bloke. He said, I've been telling Goff you'd never buckle. And I said, oh, had to, Ken. He said, you had to. I said, yeah, I said... Goff been, Goff's been sacked, Malcolm's Prime Minister, we want the legislation. <laughs> you joke about everything to the last. Reg is a sort of bloke who would always be skylarking a bit and you wouldn't really know whether he was serious or not. And the only inkling that I got that something was not right was the fact that one of my colleagues called me over to the door of the chamber. This would have been about 10, 12 past two. And said, there's some rumour going around the government's been sacked. Which I said, well, really? Tell me another one. And uh, I took no significance of it. Went back into the chamber, and of course the bills were then were put through in two or three minutes. Mr Speaker, this afternoon the Governor-General commissioned me to form a government 
until elections can be held. The 1975 supply crisis was now over. Kerr's solution had prevailed. Fraser, the caretaker Prime Minister, could now advise Kerr to call a general election. I'd suggest that honourable members on my right rem remain silent. They want to stay in the House. Whitlam, now opposition leader, despite having secured a vote of no confidence in Fraser in the House of Representatives, had to fight the election he never wanted. In fact, however, it had been a close-run thing. How much longer would the Senate have held after lunchtime on the 11th of November? How long is a piece of string? I don't know. I really don't know. Um, whether that lasted another um, week, I don't know. It was a firm decision, and uh, I have no doubt in my mind that within hours we would have uh, crossed the floor and, and given the uh, government supply. I believe that if it had gone on in a protracted sense, uh, uh, we would have uh, uh, been prepared to cross the floor. How many people here want the Liberal Party to govern after December the 13th? But the Senate held long enough, and Malcolm Fraser felt vindicated by his massive election victory on the 13th of December. Twenty years later, have you got regrets? Uh, oh, regrets in some things, I suppose, but I wouldn't have altered my actions in relation to these matters. There's nothing I would have changed in relation to that. Am I correct in saying that your real objection to what the Governor-General did was not so much the act of dismissal, but the fact that... Am I correct in saying that your real objection to what the Governor-General did was not so much the act of dismissal, but the fact that he was not frank yes, and open yes. with you. that's the whole thing. I, I've never said that, some other people have said, but I've never said it, I've never endorsed it, that he had an obligation to me because I'd appointed him. I mean, later on I apologised to the Queen for the advice I gave her. I don't blame her for appointing it, it was my fault. The dismissal terminated Gough Whitlam's Prime Ministership, but it did more than this. It made Whitlam a political martyr, and this in turn has almost overshadowed the record of his government. <laughs> Kerr's actions left him a partisan figure. This destroyed his ability as Governor-General to serve as a symbol of unity on behalf of the Crown. He was worried about security, uh, that, uh, particularly at Yarralumla, uh, that uh, the opposition, uh, not the political opposition, but uh, uh, elements of the community that were opposed to him would jump over the fence and in fact invade, physically invade Yarralumla. So he was very worried about security and and what we should be doing to ensure that uh, he was physically protected. How do you think Sir John Kerr handled that pressure well, on him? Well, I don't think he handled it well. Uh, and after a time, he wanted release from pressure. And he hoped that, you know, going out of that job would obviously take the heat off him. And you also wanted him to leave that post of Governor-General? For all these reasons, I felt it was appropriate that change be made, yes. I had the power to dismiss him and he had the power to dismiss me. The meeting condemned the threats by the Prime Minister to attempt to govern without a budget. In other words, he intends to produce chaos. And I have every confidence in our Governor-General. The 
Sir John Kerr vigorously defended the dismissal until his death in 1991. But his actions have left a permanent division over what sort of democracy Australia should be and how a Governor-General or a future President should behave. Sacked, 1975. As curves, curves. A constitutional crisis. I'm democratic. I was shocked. It's time to reveal. I, I see 